So uh, I was just going to do this sort of very informally so that we can just, uh, I'll start with some presentation and then we can have a discussion about uh, COVID-19 and shared parenting. And just a little bit background, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm a scientist and I do research, including now on COVID-19. Um, CDC has uh, set up uh, 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 an advisory group for uh, vaccine safety, which I'm serving on. We don't have any vaccines to evaluate yet. And I'm also uh, uh, working with the New York City Health Departments in their efforts to monitor uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in New York. So uh, I looked at uh, uh, one of the first things I did when I heard about the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan was I wanted to know if my children are at risk. As a parent, sort of that sort of a, a, a gut thing that uh, you want to sort of uh, uh, check that. And I looked at the data then uh, and it was clear then and it's even more clear now that COVID-19 is really a disease of older people. Middle-aged people have some risk and uh, young people and children have very, very small risk. So that means that uh, for the sake of children, there's no, real re there's no reason to, to uh, change parenting schedule because of COVID-19. Um, um, can I interrupt Martin, yes? for a second? I'm sorry. Can oh, you hear hi, me? Hector. Yep. Hi. Um, they're actually finding out now that in certain cases that um, it leads to something called Kawasaki syndrome in young children. In New York, I think three children had died and they found out in Connecticut, five of them are presenting with the Kawasaki syndrome. It's not as prevalent as for adults, but they are finding out that there are some complications with children in COVID. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Kawasaki disease is, uh, uh uh, something that sometimes is a side effect of, uh, of uh, uh, viruses. Uh, so if, so children can get sick. Sometimes they are completely asymptomatic, but sometimes they are sick. But the mortality in children is very low compared to adults. Um, uh, compared to people in the 70s, uh, the risk for children is less than, uh, well, so people in the 70s have more than 3,000 times risk of uh, uh, death mortality to uh, COVID-19 compared to children. And I looked at the statistics a little over a week ago uh, uh, when they had tallied all the deaths of children. And in the United States, there were at that time nine deaths uh, of children. And of course, that's very sad, uh, every death of a child. But we need to put that into perspective because uh, in, in that same period from February 1st until end of, uh, uh, end of April, uh, when I looked at the data, there were nine deaths in the United States of children due to COVID-19, children under age 15. And if you compare that to other things, uh, during, this, during that period, there were 101 deaths due to pneumonia, and there were 81 deaths due to influenza. So every death of a child is very tragic, of course, but if we compare it to influenza or, um, or, uh, or pneumonia or other things, uh, during this time period, there were over 5,000 total deaths of children. So only nine of them were due to COVID-19. So it's not a, a big risk factor for children, um, as, uh, and it's much less riskful for children than compared to influenza which there are always several deaths, many deaths every year. So, so it's important to put this in perspective because for older people, COVID-19 is much more dangerous than influenza. But for children, it's the opposite. It's much less dangerous. Um, and uh, this is sort of different from the last big, uh, uh, pandemic that we had uh, in 1918 of influenza, where it was primarily the young people who died. They were at high risk, while the older people were at less risk. So in this case, with COVID-19, it's the opposite. It's the old people who are at highest risk. So uh, now one could, could sort of say, well, maybe the children do not die because uh, the schools are closed. But if we then look at Europe, there's one country in Europe where 
they have not closed elementary schools um, uh, throughout this period, and that's Sweden. And uh, when I looked at the same time, there was no death of children in Sweden. Since then, I think last week, there was the first death of a child uh, in Sweden. So uh, despite not uh, closing the schools, there's only been one death to COVID-19 in children in Sweden. So uh, again, uh, 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 the risks are very small. And actually, if you compare the, the mortality of children, uh, COVID-19 has actually reduced the risk of childhood mortality because the, the, the shutdown has reduced traffic accidents uh, a, a, a lot uh, because there's fewer people driving cars, so there's fewer accidents and fewer, fewer uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths to traffic accidents. So the few deaths in children due to COVID-19 is less than the number of children who has been saved by having fewer uh, traffic accidents. And of course, we know the names of, this, of the children who died of COVID-19. We don't know the names of the people who would have died in a traffic accident if, if, uh, if times would have been normal. But as a public health person, uh, one sort of has to balance those risks in different, uh, in different, uh, to do different things and different groups. So in, su so in summary, there, there's sort of no, no reason to uh, use COVID-19 as an excuse to uh, limit uh, uh, the child to see one of the parents. And there is one, one exception where there is maybe a reason to change the parenting, and that is if the child lives with, for example, a grandparent that's above age 60 or 70, that, that grandparent, or if it's a parent at that age, are at increased risk, are at high risk of COVID-19. So then that person could be infected by the child. So the child is not then at risk, but they might, might, uh, may yeah, generate a risk in the older person. So that could be an argument for uh, that the child should then stay with the other family who doesn't have this older person. Uh, but that's really, uh, a decision for that family to take if they want to sort of give up the child to the other family to, to uh, minimize the risk to themselves. There's no reason to use it as an excuse to uh, prevent the child from seeing the other parent. Uh, so that's sort of a, a summary of the COVID-19, I think, for children. Uh, and uh, that, uh, and my, my personal story is for my, my four-year-old twins, their mother is a nurse uh, and uh, at the major hospital. So uh, she will probably be uh, exposed uh, to COVID-19 sooner or later. Um, and then she's very likely, of course, to infect the children. Uh, but I'm not worried for their, for their health uh, any more than I am for uh, just any other things like influenza or car accidents or getting cancer or whatever. Uh, there is a small risk, like for many other things, but it's nothing that it, it, uh, that I'm walking around being worried about. So that was just like a short 10-minute presentation, and then we could have a discussion if you want. Uh, please um, raise your hands for the discussion. Um, I might um, lead off. So I, I guess you covered the the situation where there's. Uh, an elderly person in the household, and the children might infect them, um, right? Or so. So then, then there might be a reason to limit the back and forth. Yeah, and then uh, it would make sense for the child to live in the household who doesn't have the older person right. uh, to protect that older person, because it's that older person that should sort of be isolated as much as possible. To minimize the exposure. Right. But that is for that older person and the family of that older person, I think, to make that decision if they want to take that risk or not. So, Hector, you're on. Um, I've, uh, I don't talk to as many parents as I do because I'm not on social media much these days, but I've heard from three families, um, high conflict families. Two of them are actually seeing their kids more now. Um, one, the, the, the ex-spouse has a new wife and kids, so 
he's overwhelmed. So she's uh, it's she's benefiting from that. The other one, I'm not exactly sure what the situation is, but for some reason, with the they're sharing the children more. I've only heard one complaint from one parent where the, the mother told the father that um, he couldn't see the son. And um, he called me up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, it's two o'clock in the morning. First of all, you shouldn't be up all night worrying about this. He says, I can't. I, I mean, we all know the answer. We're gonna be up at two o'clock in the morning worried, but I have to give him that answer to, to, to let him know that it's not good to be up at two o'clock worrying. So, um, I told him the court's open for emergency ex parte, so go file something. So he has a lawyer, but he likes to bounce things off of me. And it's interesting, like a lot of people like to talk to another parent, not just their lawyer. Um, and his lawyer told the mother, uh, we're going to court if you don't let him see his son. And so she acquiesced and now he's seeing their son. So. That's I don't know in any other cases right now where anybody stopped from seeing their children because of COVID that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, thank you. There are a couple of hands up. I think uh, Dan Cowan uh, was the first. I'll unmute you, Dan. Okay. Yeah, I just had a question for um, Martin about H1N1 versus COVID and you know the effect on kids because that was the last, I think, the last big virus we had. Right? Yeah, so H1N1 is uh, influenza, uh, uh, or like a mutation of the influenza virus. Um, and uh, influenza is, uh, it kills us, uh, a number of children every year in this country, unfortunately. And uh, uh, I mean, that's one reason why we have the vaccine. Influenza is also often spread through children. Uh, that's Children are like one of the primary spreaders of influenza. But uh, COVID-19 is less dangerous for children than H1N1, but COVID is more dangerous for older people than H1N1, much, much more so. Maureen has her hand up, so Maureen. Yes, so I wanted to uh, let you know that actually in Connecticut, uh, under the court's um, website, Connecticut Judicial, if you Google that, um, and you look under frequently asked questions, you'll see that one of the questions was um, what happened to custody agreements during this COVID period? And the answer from the courts is that those agreements are still in play and should still be uh, respected and adhered to. So um, one of the things Hector had mentioned, and this is probably in the cases that tend more towards the alienation rather than parents who are willing to be cooperative, um, is that that can be used, um, you, you know, there may be people, we may not have heard of them yet, but I, I know from my own son's case, we do have that issue happening where the mother has said, oh, the child's doing fine. And yeah, her, her determination of fine is that her child is not resistant anymore because she's not being forced to have the in-person monthly visits. So what we tried to do was set up video conferencing and um, the reunification therapist had made it clear that there's supposed to be visual, visu visual sight on these conferences. Uh, the child can't cover up her head with the floppy hat and the sunglasses, yet that is happening. In fact, it's progressively getting worse because it's, um, it's uh, evolved to the point that now she points the camera to the ceiling. So at this point, we put we have put in a motion, non-arguable motion, because those are getting um, faster attention than if you put in a regular motion and you have to wait for a trial or a hearing date. Um, and uh, the therapist had indicated that you know therapist therapy is needed at this point. So I just wanted people to be aware of the fact that with couples that are able, and hopefully they're doing this, but there are those out there that I'm sure are struggling with this, um, the smaller percentage of people who are dealing with the alienation part of this. 
Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention, there was a, it was interesting when Martin mentioned um, healthcare workers, nurses and stuff. Um, there have been a few cases on my mass uh, bar association thread with lawyers in the, wanting help with clients who are uh, in the healthcare field, doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses who are going through divorce and they're finding that um, the spouse uh, who is not willing to cooperate has used the COVID, weaponized the COVID-19 situation to request sole custody. And actually in, in Massachusetts, it has, we know of one case where the judge has said, well, because you're a healthcare provider, in particular, this was a doctor and you're at higher risk because of your exposure, um, then that presents a big issue and therefore we don't want the best interest of the child is to keep you away from your child. And as a result of that, this practitioner who's sacrificing an awful lot um, because she deals with the stress of having to bring it home to her family and now she goes out to the front line and has very long um, back to back 12 hour shifts and it's been horrendous. Um, the AFCC has put something on their website. Uh, the AFCC, by the way, is uh, the, Associ the Association of Familial Courts. Um, it's a, an association that has judges and lawyers and therapists and psychologists, and they usually um, develop um, certain, um, um, it's a multidisciplinary discipline type of board that presents and trains professionals and how how best to um, implement best practices in the court, let's say. So um, they have come out with a group of suggestions that um, really, if you have a client that has this, they need to promote the, um, the mitigation pra practice that the hospitals are using and that the healthcare providing healthcare provider is hopefully adhering to in fighting these uh, this these requests for sole custody. But that is something that we need to be aware of because unfortunately, um, some people will try to weaponize that COVID-19, um, you know, uh, this era that we're in now. Thanks, Maureen. That's, that's really helpful. I've got yeah. two hands up. One is Suresh. I think you're next, Suresh. Right, I've got to get you unmuted here. There you go. Yes, um, I have uh, uh, one brief comment and uh, um, regarding parental alienation. And uh, uh, in my particular case, the COVID situation uh, seemed to have helped because my children would refuse to um, come home with me. And, um, and the, uh, the parent uh, the unification therapist basically said, well, that's your advantage. You need to say it's not safe anywhere and you're gonna go home with me. And I actually use that to, to an advantage. And that seemed to have worked because my kids have now been coming to my home for the past three weeks, which is, I haven't really seen them or really, I mean, they were jumping out of the car just uh, two months ago. And, uh, but now they're coming home and they're staying over one night. And that's at least, that's what has been done. And the COVID situation has, um, well, at least we, we had a slightly different perspective, uh, and, and that, that seemed to have helped. The mother resisted a great deal, wow. but, um, but after nine months or so, now I'm getting to see my children again, so that's good. That's great. Still, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Did you have uh, to they still hate me. But, hmm? Did you have to go to court to get that? Yes. Um, in Jan my, my wife uh, refused uh, 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 counseling for the children. Uh, which was the first thing in the agreement that I signed back in August. Um, so in January, I filed a motion saying we need to have. Ah, okay. Saying, you know, the, the children have not seen a psychologist in eight months. So they court ordered a, a, a reunification therapist. And, and the therapist is excellent, as far as I could tell. Uh, no nonsense. And she seems to be working with the GAL to get this done. And she's seen um, us directly, uh, even during this COVID crisis, which is awesome. Yeah, and she's really making a big difference. Um, the the other question is a slightly orthogonal question, uh, mostly targeted, and I'm happy to talk about this with you know offline with with anyone. Um, just to and this is fresh because this is just happening. This this last weekend was the third time they you know third time they spend the night here, and that has reduced my stress level by a great deal, which is awesome. 
Um, the second question uh, is um, uh, for Martin. And uh, I do know that H1N1, in terms of um, uh, in terms of reoccurrence of the, of the you know, when, when, when people retest being positive, is that a common, you know, where you have the initial uh, response where you test positive and then you test negative and then you, and then you have little blips uh, where you test positive again. Is that a common, uh, is that a typical response uh, uh, of your body where, you know, you, you have a spike in viral load and then it goes back down again as your body kills it? Or is that unique to the uh, coronavirus? Uh, with COVID-19, there are two types of tests. Uh, the common test tests whether you are infected right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will be positive if you're infected, and that will be negative uh, after you uh, are no longer uh, have the COVID-19. So after you uh, are well, it will be negative. Mm -hmm. And that is the common test that's used uh, right now and that has been available for quite some time. Uh, the other type of test for COVID-19 is an antibody test. Uh, those are just coming, uh, uh, those are just being developed. Uh, and that test, if you have ever been uh, sick with COVID-19. So if you have been sick, but you're no longer sick, that means you are, are immune. Uh, so, but those tests are just recently becoming available there are different manufacturers or different developers of them, and it's still a little bit unclear, I think, exactly how, how accurate they are. Uh, I assume that some are more accurate than others, but I haven't followed the exact uh, uh, nature of uh, how, how these are being developed. But right now, they are primarily used in healthcare settings, uh, but eventually, I expect them to be more widely applied to the population at large. Okay, and uh, so when, when they test again for the live virus and not the antibody test, uh, you know, once you test negative, is, it, is there a likelihood that you will test positive again? I think that's unlikely unless there's something wrong with the actual test procedure. Because, actual test procedure. Okay, all right. Uh, because uh, uh, there has been no confirmed situations where somebody was infected twice. So somebody who had the COVID-19 and then became sick a second time there were some uh, reports from South Korea, uh, but they turned out to be wrong uh, once they investigated them. So we have no confirmed cases where somebody got in, getting it twice. And uh, is this virus very different from say hepatitis B, which remains in the body for many people chronically? Uh, or is the structure of the virus so different that it's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, th that you know it, it can go I mean uh, if this virus turns out like hepatitis B then we're going to be living with this for quite some time uh, that's what I'm thinking but I don't think it's like hepatitis B so once you are once you uh, have beaten the virus you're sort of free from it but we don't uh, I think we will live with it for a long time this is not going to go away and uh, I believe that most of us will be infected sooner or later Okay. So Hector has his hand up. Hector. Yeah, hi. I, I just got a quick question to Maureen. Did I hear you correctly? Um, you said a judge withheld visitation or access because of COVID? Yes, up in, that's what we saw on uh, the Mass Bar thread. Um, because I'm a retired attorney, I'm part of the Mass Bar Association. And um, we had a number of attorneys weigh in that they're having Good, they're having concerns now about um, the healthcare providers because um, the ones that are going through the divorce process, uh, you know, the father will or the mother. But let's say it could be a guy who's a healthcare provider, um, where one party will try to weaponize it and say, "I want sole custody because it's not in the best interest of the child. The child's placed at higher risk." And the judge, there is a case up here that one of the attorneys reported on, where the judge did deprive, um, did give sole custody to the other parent just based on that alone. Temporary yeah. or full or permanent? Temporary. No, I, well, here's the thing. Uh, the judge left it in the order that until such time as the mother uh, is, uh, th till this COVID uh, uh, era it has provided better, uh, a better situation where she can come in now, she still has to prove that she should have uh, shared custody. It's now the burden is on her to come back 
after it. So it's put an awful burden on these healthcare providers to do this. And uh, one of the arguments, again, AFCC was looked to for guidance and apparently, and I went online to the AFCC website. Uh, and again, these are judges and um, psychologists that confer with one another. And they have suggested that uh, it's good if you can determine the protocol that's used by the healthcare provider, that she's adhering to it, that it's best practices, um, and get very detail-oriented when you're in front of a judge. Um, because they, again, they raise arguments as to uh, compare COVID-19 to other risky situations. Um, and when do you prevent a parent from having access simply because of their work situation? You know, so it's, it's become a big issue right now I understand limited access, but I don't understand the basis for the sole custody because COVID doesn't affect, unless you're hospitalized, it, um, it doesn't affect your decision-making capabilities. And you can still parent, co-parent via, uh, I don't agree with this judge. I'm very upset. Yeah. No, but again, what Martin's pointing out as far as the data, and this is the things that parents will need to, uh, it's very important information. Um, and this might be good to put on the website, John, for the shared yes. parenting website, as to the data there for how it, uh, you know, is it more dangerous than the flu? Uh, Martin's alluded to that it, it was not more dangerous for children in regards to, um, you know, um, the mortality. And, and, um, also, the fact of um, how does it impact children, and Martin went into that earlier in the conversation. Those type of th that type of information, having the scientific data and references to use in court, could be very helpful to parents because if they find themselves in this situation, they, they it would be very helpful. And that you have to really get specific and arm yourself with information coming in there because this is what some parents may be up against if one of the parents decide to seek sole custody and use this. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's important to get the information out um, for, for all those parents who aren't going to court too. We're just trying yeah. to, to work things out. And there are really, I think there are many more of those who, than who are trying to use the court resources to settle their disputes. Uh, for, but my son was one of those, in fact, um, and he's just trying to work things out with the uh, mother of his child. Um, and early on, she kept the child for a whole month but during, you know, very first, so when they were, I guess, basically the month of March. Um, and, and I guess, you know, he decided that he, you know, didn't want to challenge it. Um, and, and, you know, there wasn't as much information out there then about the risk to children. Um, but now I think it's really important to get this information out. And, and I guess they already figured this out because my son sees his daughter again. Uh, Maureen, uh, I, I, uh, I was asked by the National Parents Organization to yep. write a couple of things. So that was posted on their blog. And so if you want, you maybe could spread that uh, thing with your, uh, at the Massachusetts attorney's uh, list. That you oh, that's a great, on. great idea. Thank you. Yes. I will. And we'll get that on the shared parenting blog too. Yep. Uh, there was a similar case in Florida where a judge, uh, they had 50-50 custody and the judge gave uh, uh, full custody to the father because the mother was working either as a doctor or a nurse. I forgot which one. So there's a similar case there where where COVID-19 was used. Which is very uh, very unfortunate. Mm. But it's also uh, great to hear uh, the stories from both Hector and Suresh that uh, it can actually go the other way. That it improves the situation for the children that they get to spend more time with both their parents. So that's right. really, really nice to, to hear. Yeah. That warms my heart. Very good for the children. Uh, well, we did promise to keep these to about half an hour. And uh, so unless there's one final question here or any other comments or questions that anybody wants to, to raise, we're going to get this out on our website We've got a really good thing going here. Uh, Colleen is organizing every week. A different professional will be presenting information. Next week, it's going to be Maureen talking about uh, uh, legal shared parenting terms and uh, 
the language of legal shared parenting. Um, and we're going to go on from there. So there's a lot of activity now. Colleen, do you have any final, this is kind of your, your baby here. Any, any final uh, comments? No, thank you, thank you, Juan Martin. Really appreciate it, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you thank, next thank week, you. 8 p.m. next Tuesday. So okay, long. take Thanks, care. Thanks, Martin. Thanks very much yeah. for your time. Thanks for a good discussion. Bye-bye. Yeah.